Was this a test of our faith? And what that means is feel what we're feeling because God has made a way. But believers must be reminded that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, amen. Man, what a morning of worship. We just praise God for everything we've been a part of here today, uplifting His wonderful and holy name. It's a privilege to be with you and representing. You're a part of a family, 3,000 Southern Baptist churches across the state of Florida, of which you are a part of that fellowship. And God is using this family in great ways to plant churches, to revitalize churches, to see many people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I come today just with a great uh, appreciation in my heart for you. I've known uh, Dr. Wesley, and we served together on committees through the years as I was a pastor here in Florida. I was at First Baptist Brandon for about 20 years as pastor before I accepted this role. And I've been so uh, appreciative of him, of his faithful leadership, and he and Miss Jean are wonderful leaders of this church, and I know that you want to say thank you to Pastor Green and his wife for their wonderful leadership here at Christ's Way. I ask you today to open God's Word to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, we're going to read verse 27. Karen read from God's Word earlier. We want to focus today particularly on that one verse, verse 27. And if you're able, I would ask you to stand in honor of God's precious Word, Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning with verse 27. This is the Word of the Lord coming to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? Some of us today need to hear this word. We need to be reminded of the greatness and the glory of our Lord. Be reminded that he has not forgotten you, forsaken you, or forfeited you. He knows right where you are. He knows your name. He knows your need. And he has a word for you today. And that word may very well be a reminder of the God that we serve. Is there anything too hard for for me. May we hear God's word with great profit within our lives today. Thank you. You may be seated. This scripture is at a very critical point in the life of God's covenant people. They are looking back on what God has done. Even as we heard the scripture earlier today, the great reminder of God's presence and of God's power among them. They're in a moment in the present where they're dealing with a situation that is quite difficult and quite overwhelming to them. And they're looking to a future, and many of them are wondering, is there a future? Is there still a plan and a purpose for God, for our nation, for our lives individually? This scripture is set in the context of an instruction from God to the prophet Jeremiah. And that instruction is, buy the land buy the field. Now, this doesn't really seem like a lot. People buy land every day. People are involved in business transactions, as probably many of you were even over this past week. But yet, as the word came to Jeremiah, it came in the midst of a moment in history in the life of this nation where buying property made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Because as you look in this chapter, you will see in verses 1 and in verse 2 that Jeremiah had been placed in prison. He was in prison because he was preaching the word of God. King Zedekiah did not find favorably the words that Jeremiah had been declaring. For Jeremiah had prophesied that God's judgment was going to come upon God's people. Now nobody likes to hear that. If I started out today this message by saying, Fresh Way Fellowship, this week God's going to pour his wrath down upon you, most of you would probably say, Pastor Wesley, why did you invite that guy to come? That's really not what we want to hear. And so in this moment, the prophet of the Lord is speaking forth the truth of God's word. And that's what a prophet does. The prophet speaks God's word. God's word is not dependent upon our acceptance 
of God's Word. God's Word is dependent upon the faithfulness of our hearing of God's Word and understanding that God is a sovereign, holy, mighty, and righteous God. And so Jeremiah has heard a word from the Lord. And the word is, you've been an unfaithful people. The word is, you've been a sinful people. The word is, you have turned away from the very presence of God himself. And God is bringing judgment upon you. Well, the king didn't like that preacher. And so he put the preacher in jail. But there's one thing about it. You can put the preacher in jail, but you can't silence the message of God. And so even while Jeremiah is in prison, God's prophetic word is coming to pass. And this is the context. The Babylonians at that time had risen to power on the world scene. And they were seeking to conquer the known world as it existed during that time. And the people of God, the nation of Israel, the very city of Jerusalem was on their radar. And they're sieging the city. They are taking people from their homes. And they're leading them away into captivity. If you've read in the Old Testament, you've read about the Babylonian captivity. And indeed, many people were taken from their families and from their homes and from their businesses and from their comfortable life that they were living, and they were taken to a distant land. They were removed from everything that they felt was secure. It had been ripped away from them. And so while all of this is going on, Jeremiah receives a word from God by the land, by the field. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense, does it? Why would you buy land when the Babylonians are taking your land? Why would you buy land when your people are being taken away? Why would you buy land when you're sitting in jail? Why would you buy land in a moment when everything seems to be lost? Because God has a plan. And because God is greater than our present circumstances. And God sees what we cannot see. And God knows what we do not know. And God's already been where we're simply getting to ourselves. And so while God had spoken to Jeremiah and said, judgment is coming, now God is speaking to Jeremiah and saying, buy the land, because when you buy the land, Jeremiah, you are saying to the people, God isn't finished with us yet. God will restore. God will again deliver his people. And so here from this prison cell, Jeremiah receives this instruction by the land. Now, if you read through the history of this entire Babylonian issue, in 587 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed the temple there in Jerusalem, the temple that had been built by Solomon himself. That sacred, holy temple is absolutely in ruin and in rubble at the hands of the Babylonians. People have been removed from their homeland. A remnant has remained there in Jerusalem even during this 70-year period. But yet, even in the midst of the power of the Babylonians, they were not an unconquerable people. For there was another group who rose up, Cyrus. Cyrus and the Persians. And they defeated the Babylonians. And in 539 B.C., Cyrus, the king of Persia, said to all those people who were in exile at the hand of the Babylonians, I don't want you here. Go back home. Go back home. Now think about that. Jeremiah's in prison many years earlier, and God's saying, buy the land. Everything is being destroyed. God's judgment is falling down upon them. But God said, I still have a future for you. Buy the land, Jeremiah. Buy the land, Jeremiah. And now in 539 B.C., everybody comes home, and guess what? Jeremiah and his family own the land because God said, I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. I know where you are. 
and I know what you need. And sometimes I'm going to lead you to do something that may not make a lot of sense in the moment. But you trust me. You hold on to me because I see what you can't see. And I know what you don't know. So this morning, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture. It's become a favorite of mine. Uh, just, just, just reading it, you, you, you're, you're just inspired and you're encouraged. When, when you read it, you're reminded of, of who God is. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And I want us to examine this scripture in light of three questions. They just walk through this text, verse 27. The first question is, what do you believe God can do. Now, what do you believe God can do? Now, Brother Wesley, I know you're a faithful preacher of God's Word, and I know you've taught God's Word to this congregation, and I know they've heard the Word of God, and I doubt if there's anyone here today who would say, I don't believe the Bible is God's Word. There's probably no one who's here today who would say, well, I don't believe that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, went to a cross, died for our sins, was buried, and resurrected from the grave. There's probably no one here today who would deny that. There's no one here today who would deny the miracles of God. You see, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things that we believe in our head. And oftentimes we struggle in following them with our heart. What do you believe God can do? When God spoke to Jeremiah in this verse, he says, I am the Lord. Now, recently, we've seen many people make statements and drop microphones. I'm not going to drop your mic because it probably, <laughs> probably costs something. <laughs> but, but, but if there's ever a moment where God just drops the mic, that's it. <laughs> I am the Lord. Boom. What else does he need to say? I am the Lord. I mean, shouldn't that be enough for us? Shouldn't that be enough for you? Shouldn't that be enough for me? I am the Lord. What a statement. What a magnificent affirmation of the splendor and the glory and the majesty of Almighty God. And oftentimes we know it in our head, but we don't follow it with our hearts. Some of you today need to be reminded that he still is Lord. I am the Lord. Now, this phrase, I am, is found throughout the Scripture. I mean, Jesus used it when he said, I'm the door, I'm the shepherd, I'm the, you know, on and on you go. But, but we find it most prominent in its beginnings in the book of Exodus, in chapters 3 and 4. You remember that, that experience with Moses as he's out in the wilderness tending sheep, tending the flock, and he came upon a bush, and that bush was burning as fire, but yet it wasn't being consumed because in that bush was the presence of God. And God spoke to Moses from that bush. And he had a message for Moses, the same message that we need to be reminded of. He's not forgotten us. He's not forsaken us. He's not forfeited us. My people are in Egypt. They are in bondage. They are in slavery. And I'm going to set them free. And Moses, I want you to go and I want you to stand before the most powerful man on the planet. And I want you to put your finger in his face and say, let my people go. What did Moses do? Well, Lord, I'm, I'm on the way. No. Nah. <laughs> Moses just started making excuses. Now, let's don't be too hard on Moses. I've made excuses. And I suspect you've probably made a few excuses too. Think about those excuses Moses made. You know, it doesn't take much to stop us, Pastor. It really doesn't. You know, I mean, it doesn't take much to sidetrack us, get my feelings hurt. I don't like this. I don't like that. You know, well, they didn't include me. They didn't ask me. Well, I, I mean, we, we can have many things that the evil one can use to, to distract us and to divert us and to keep us from being focused upon who God is. And so Moses just starts making excuses. He says, well, you know, who am I? <laughs> who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? You know, well, what's your name? They, they're not going to listen to me. They won't believe me. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. 
And finally, the fifth excuse, just in resignation, he says, Lord, just send someone else. But God said, no, uh, it's you, Moses. You're the one that I'm calling. You're the one that I am commanding to go. And when he asked him what his name was, he said, tell them that I am that I am has sent you. I am that I am. You know what that means literally in the Hebrew text? This is what it means. I will always be what I've always been. I will continually be what I repeatedly have been. You see, he is the God who is faithful. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. What God has always been will be what God will always be. He is the unchanging, eternal God. He is the God of creation. He is the God of salvation. And he is the God of eternity. And we trust him. I am the Lord. I will always be what I have always been. Now, sometimes in our churches, we have a hard time trusting what God is and who God is and what God can do. I was on a Sunday morning when I was pastor at First Baptist Brandon, which is up beside the Tampa community. We had three services on Sunday morning, and I I just went from, two were in the same room and one was in another room. And so once I started preaching, I just, I just didn't quit through the whole morning. You know, sometimes that third service, I'm like, did I just say that? And I don't know if I did or not, to be honest. I mean, I've just, you know, you just, your mind's just, just flowing. And so I was in between those services and I had a deacon to come to me. And he said, Pastor, you need to come with me and come right now. Well, typically when that happened, there were maybe a couple things that were going wrong. One, somebody has a medical emergency. And they just want the pastor to come and to maybe speak to the family or speak to the individual, do whatever. Or secondly, there's a toilet that's overflowing, and they think the pastor can fix the toilet, you know. And quite honestly, I can't, and I don't know if Brother Wesley can or not either, you know. But that was not the case at all. We walked outside the buildings. We had about 20, 25 acres of property on our, on our campus. And, and, and as we walked outside, I mean, I was just stunned for standing on the sidewalks. Just, just imagine if you were looking out this window on those sidewalks all down that road and around surrounding your campus were individuals standing holding signs. They were protesting the church. They had messages on there about me. They had messages about our church. They had messages about, about God. That, that there were some of the most ungodly things you've ever seen or ever heard in your life. Now the background of this is that our church was taking a stand on an issue within our community. And when you take a stand, get ready, because there's going to be a fight. When, when, when you believe that I am the Lord and God has a plan and a purpose greater than not just coming and sitting in chairs on Sunday and feeling good about worship and going home and not applying it day by day, when you get to that point, get ready, because spiritual warfare is going to happen in your life and in your church. And so we had taken a stand. There was an, an adult entertainment business that wanted to open in our community. They were purchasing a, a building. This building was on one of the major thoroughfares in Brandon. Came to a red light. On this corner was the building they wanted to purchase. On this corner was a Chick-fil-A and a Home Depot. Now tell me if that's not worlds colliding <laughs> in terms of, 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 of just our culture. And so we, we, along with other churches in our, in our town, were taking a stand against it. We kind of became the lightning rod for, for the adult entertainment community. And so on that sidewalk on that morning were strippers and men dressed like women and women dressed like men. There, there were individuals out there who worked in this industry. There was a man by the name of Joe Redner who is the kingpin of adult entertainment across central Florida. He's probably a multi-gazillionaire, and he's made his money off human sex trafficking and overdoing these things with individuals and ladies demeaning and devaluing who they are. And we were taking a stand against this business opening within our community. What do you do? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this morning? I mean, if you pulled up and that's what you saw out there, what, what, what would you do? I mean, you know, dear ladies having to walk through that from parking lots and, and people shouting and screaming at them as they, as they would go by. And so we determined this. God loves those people as much as he loves us. They need his salvation as much as we need his salvation. And so we were just going to love them in the name of Jesus. Pastor earlier talked about food afterwards. Baptists got food everywhere, you know. I mean, we're good at that. So they would take water and food out to them while they were out there protesting and shouting at us, you know. <laughs> 
dear sweet ladies would walk by those, those, those girls that were young ladies that were out there and they'd hug them and say, oh, I hope you come back next Sunday. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not so sure that we really want them, you know, but anyway, it's evangelism. What can I say? I don't know, you know. We did everything we could do. I mean, we, we took every legal battle. We did every government thing we knew. We leveraged every relationship that we had to try to stop this, and it, and it didn't stop. We, we lost the battle, but we didn't lose the war. Because at that red light, there is a Chick-fil-A and a Home Depot, and there is this adult entertainment business. So as parents begin pulling up in their vehicles at that red light from the back seat of SUVs and minivans and cars, children begin asking the question, what's that? I mean, the signage is a little different on those buildings in case you haven't noticed that, you know, when you see those. And, and parents were just very honest, you know, in there, you know, young ladies are being taken advantage of. In there, they're not, they're not showing the, the true value of, of, of a woman's worth as God intended for them to have. And people are taking advantage of them. And I have more parents begin to tell me, as did other, parents, other pastors in town, that, that, that children begin praying in the back seats of those cars. They begin praying for those ladies that were working in these businesses. And I'll tell you, within less than one year, God shut that place down. And it wasn't because... It wasn't because we had all the legal fights. It wasn't because we, we were in every newspaper. It wasn't because all the, the newscasts were doing articles. It was because children believed what God could do. <laughs> and from the back seat of cars, they prayed down heaven on that place and shut it down. So I ask you today, what do you believe God can do? I am the Lord. I'll just stop. I mean, that really much as you can say. But I, but I want us to come to a second question in this text. And, and the second question is, what is God leading you to do? Yeah. In you. What, what is God leading you to do? He led Jeremiah to buy land. Didn't make sense, but Jeremiah purchased the land. And God proved himself faithful. God proved himself in the midst of that decision to honor obedience and to honor humility and to honor faithfulness unto him. So what is God leading you to do? He says he is the God of all flesh. And last I checked, that includes us. He is the God of all flesh. He is the God of all flesh today. In February 2019, he is the God of all flesh. He is the God of every person who is in this room today. He is the God of every neighbor, every co-worker, every person that you encounter, every stranger that you see. He is the God of all flesh. What is God leading you to do? I run not on, from people. I run intentionally. I, I, try to, I try to run every day. I run about four miles a day. You can't really tell it. I mean, I'm getting old and gaining weight and I'm trying to stay ahead of the curve. You know, it's hard to do. <laughs> Very hard to do, actually. And uh, so we, we used to run kind of in uh, 5Ks, you know, competitive kind of things. And not really for the purpose of trying to, you know, compete, but just, just to be a part of a big group of folks doing something. It's always kind of fun to do. And so, so I was running this 5K. I was, I was up in Georgia. I was running this 5K. And uh, the track, you know, they, they always have about at the midpoint of it where, where you really got to gut it out, where you just got to decide, am I in this or not in this? Am I going to press on or am I just going to kind of, you know, give up and quit? And, and, and in Georgia, they have these things called hills. Now, for those who are in Florida, <laughs> a hill is an incline. You know, you kind of go up it, you know, and it, it's a little bit challenging. It really is. And so right in the middle of this race, they had these roller coaster hills. And so, man, I mean, I, I'm just clicking. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm, a, I'm an a, you know, Olympic athlete. I mean, until I get to those hills. And when I get to those hills, I'm like, oh, no, you know. So I get to the first one, and I make it over, and I'm thinking, okay, this is good. Well, then I see there's another one. You go every up, got it down, so you go down, then you're going to go up again. And so I get over the second one, and, man, I'm thinking, okay, man, that's got to be it. Well, no, there's a third one up there, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my, I don't know, you know. And so I'm just I'm pressing as hard as I can. I'm running along there, and, and, and I'm, you know, you, you focus forward. You don't look back, and, 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 and you can hear things all around you. and start, I start hearing the, the the, the, these feet getting closer to me. 
And, uh, you know, you, you can just hear it. And, and so, you know, you're kind of like, man, I, I don't want to be passed on a hill. And so do I need to run faster? Well, I can't run faster. I mean, I'm, I'm giving everything I got right now, you know. And, and, then, and, and, and so I, I kept hearing getting closer and closer. And finally, out of my peripheral vision, here is the person that is passing me. It's a young lady. She's probably about 24, 25, 26 years old. She's pushing a baby <laughs> in a running stroller and going up a hill. She passes me. She looks at me and she says, you're doing so good. Just keep trying. I'm like, what? <laughs> you just ripped my heart out at this moment, you know. I mean, it was just demoralizing. I mean, I wanted to quit, but I just kept running, you know. We've got to be reminded we can't quit. We can't give up. We've got to keep pressing on. I mean, I've kind of noticed in life there's always somebody that's going to run by you. There's always somebody that you think, well, man, why is God blessing them? And I don't seem to be getting those blessings. Why does their life just seem to soar? And mine just seems to be a struggle. Why, why in their life do, do they just seem, everything they touch just seems to work and everything I touch just seems to fall apart. And God says, don't forget, I'm the God of all flesh. And I know your name and I know your need and I haven't forgotten you and I haven't forsaken you. Just keep running the race. Can... Can we be transparent? We probably all had times that we wanted to give up because we'd just given out. I mean, I, I'm not speaking for pastor here, but I've been a pastor. And I guarantee you in 25 years, there's been some times where the Wesley probably just thought, you know, it'd be a lot easier to do something else. But you know what? He kept running. Because this is what God had called him to do. This is what God called him to do. There were times that maybe some of you thought, well, it, might, it, it looks a little better over there. I mean, man, that church, that church. But, but you stayed because that's what God wanted you to do. And you keep pressing on. You keep pushing on. We've all quietly thought about quitting. This is my last Sunday. I'm not appreciated. I'm not reckoned. They don't applaud me. Nobody's patted me on the back, and, and, and I'm in there with them kids every week. And, and I mean, this is it. I'm done. <laughs> and let's just be real. That's the reality. The struggles that we have. Even in ministry, men struggle. Just this past week, another article about a pastor who committed suicide. 1,400 ministers leave the ministry every month in the United States of America. 1,400 every month. 900 Southern Baptist churches close their doors every year. So we've all silently struggled. And there are times that I don't hear about how God is blessing you because <laughs> I just feel inadequate and overwhelmed. I might put a smile on when you're telling me that, but inside I, I get angry. Why not me? Lord, have you forgotten me? Lord, what about me? Lord, what about me? I'm in the prison, Lord. I'm struggling. And he just gently by his spirit reminds us, I am the Lord. I'm the God of all flesh. The first church that I served as pastor was in rural Louisiana. I was in seminary. New Orleans, Baptist Theological Seminary. It was a dairy farming community. Everything in the community centered around the milking of cows, even the church. Our schedule depended upon cows, and that's kind of how we rolled. And it was fine. Never had preached really much. I mean, I just here and there, and now all of a sudden I'm standing in front of a people, and they're looking at me. And I'm like, me? <laughs> I don't know if I'd even come hear me preach, much less you. And and yet God gave me that assignment. And Karen and I were young, 
We had, a, had two of our children that were just toddlers at that time, and all of a sudden, here you're in that role. It was easy to beat yourself up. It's easy to, to, to get overwhelmed by it. And, and uh, my mom and dad visited me and visited us at that time and had a Bible. And uh, my mom said, my, your dad and I bought you this Bible. We just want to give it to you. And so I was so thankful, you know, beautiful Bible. And I opened it up. And in the, in the front of that Bible, my mom had written a message to me. It was the most encouraging message I think I'd ever had in my life. And that was probably in about 1982. And it's 2019. And guess what? Last week, I opened that Bible and I read that message again. Because sometimes we just need to know that God uses people to see things in us that we don't see in ourselves. That, that, that God uses people to encourage us when we need encouragement. God uses his spirit to quicken you. You know, the next time God prompts you to say something to someone, do it. The next time God prompts you to pray for someone, pray. The next time God prompts you to give to someone, give. The next time God calls you to call someone, call. The next time God prompts you to go somewhere, go. Because you don't know what a difference you're going to make in that person's life. What is God leading you to do? What's he leading you to do today? He's leading some of you to join this choir. I mean, it'd be tough. I couldn't join it because I don't have any rhythm, okay? <laughs> he may be leading some of you to teach. He's leading some of you to be a part of different ministries. He's leading some of you to tithe. He's leading some of you to sacrificially give. He's leading some of you to pray. He's leading some of you to quit gossiping and griping. He's leading some of you to stop creating discord and division. He's leading some of you to stand up for your family. He's leading some of you to believe in your son and your daughter and your husband or your wife. He's leading some of you today to do something that seems insignificant to the world. But in that person's life, it makes all the difference to them. And God is using you. What is God leading you to do? We place limits on what we believe God can do and limits on what we commit to do for the Lord. I'm the God of all flesh. But there's a third question that we would ask from this text. What do you believe God can do? What is God leading you to do? The third question, what hinders you? From responding to God. And what hinders you today from responding to God in salvation? What, what hinders you today from responding to God in obedience? What, what hinders you today from responding to God in holiness and righteousness and purity? He's calling you within your life to live. You, know, you read the last part of that text and it's almost embarrassing that, that, that we would do anything that would not be fully of our lives unto the Lord. I mean, God from heaven, who created the heavens and the earth, who controls all things by his great power and by his eternal might, who gave his one and only son to be the savior of the sins and the savior of mankind. He gave his only son who one day will return in power and in glory and authority, who has created a new heaven and a new earth, who will forever be with him free from pain and sickness and sadness and sorrow and sin and suffering and death. All things are made new. This God says, is there anything too hard for me? Oh my goodness. I got to believe Jeremiah just, he had a pillow in that jail cell. He just covers his head at that moment and said, God, forgive me <laughs> because I've allowed things to be hard for you that aren't hard. I've believed a lie that, that, that all things aren't possible with you. Lord, I know that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So what hinders you? What hinders you from responding to God? Who are we to question the what, the how, the when, the why, and the where of God? 
mean, who are we to do that? We are his children. We're the sheep of his pasture. Who are we? Who are we to limit the majesty and the glory of God? That everything in our life should be unto His praise, unto His honor, and unto His glory alone. For what seems improbable or impossible for you, God leads you with the promise and provision of His power and of His presence. What hinders you from responding to God today? A couple of pictures I want you to see. If you put the first picture up, I would appreciate it. This picture is the First Baptist Church of Port St. Joe, Florida. This photograph was taken just hours after Hurricane Michael came on shore in the panhandle. You can see a lighthouse kind of in the back distance. I mean, that's how close this church is to the Gulf of Mexico. There's really nothing that stands between them and the Gulf. And on that day, there was nothing that stood between them and Hurricane Michael. The Sunday before Hurricane Michael, Pastor Boyd Evans, who is the pastor of this church, said it was the greatest Sunday that he could remember and that most could remember in the history of the church. They had baptized 13 people on that Sunday morning. I guarantee you on Monday morning, Pastor Boyd didn't get up and pray, well, Lord, we had such a great Sunday. Why don't you send Hurricane Michael this week and just pelt us good? He didn't ask for this, nor did anyone else in that panhandle. Storm came ashore. It hit their church. Looks like it's been bombed out. Matter of fact, the church building itself will not even survive. They've got to just push it down. The church has no insurance because they couldn't afford the kind of coverage that, that they needed. And so they're just at a total. I mean, when I say a loss, I mean a total loss. The church following, hold on to the second picture for a moment. The church following the storm. You have to wait to see if they even have a community anymore. People began returning, and they knew that they needed to have a place of fellowship. And so on the opposite side of this building, standing there as it stands in ruin, they, they, they had rented and, and, or purchased this big event tent, and, and they, they had it set up where they could meet there on Sundays. I mean, you got to have it. <laughs> About three weeks after they set up that tent, Another storm blew through and destroyed the tent. Now, I mean, you're talking about sorrow upon sorrow and wave upon wave. I mean, I guess they're kind of thinking now, well, Lord, do you even want us to be here? I mean, what, what are you saying to us, Lord? Go to the next picture. That's the inside of the church. Can you imagine the hopes, the dreams, the prayers, the, the preaching, the salvations, the, 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 the sacrifices that have been made through the years? I mean, you know, th th those, things, those things represent people believing and, and giving and, and doing everything together to make that, and now it's just been total, complete loss. Total loss. There are over 50 churches in the panhandle that look from there to more minimal damage. Southern Baptist churches, part of our family. Now, I, I've never seen anything that hit so many churches. And it, it, it didn't discriminate. I mean, every church of any denomination. I mean, their, their buildings are just, just in total ruin. And it's not just the churches, the pastor's homes. I talked with a pastor at a church, and he just stood there and wept because he had just left his home where the insurance agent had told them they're going to have to just push it down because you gather what you can gather out of here because we just got to push it down. Then he comes back to his church and they have almost the same scenario with their church, and yet they're out there serving water <laughs> and food to their community. Because the one message, hear this, the one message that I have consistently heard over and over and over and over and over and over and over again by the pastors and the churches in that communities is this. Go back to the previous picture. We stand in their parking lots and look at those buildings and just weep. And the pastor will take his finger and he'll point at that church and he'll say, but Tommy, that's not the church. We're the church. 
Wait a minute. <laughs> what do you believe God can do? What's God leading you to do? And what hinders you from responding? And, the, and, and, and what we're seeing in this panhandle right now, as we're trying to find a new normal, which would take a long time for that to happen, obviously, but the churches have an open door that they've never had before. And people are more open than they've ever been before. And we're hearing testimony after testimony of people who are coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And we're seeing things happen that are the evidence of God's hand even beyond this event that God had not forgotten them. God had not forfeited them. God had not forsaken them. But now they're having to say, we can't depend upon a building to be the church. We must be the church. I hope it doesn't take a hurricane for any of us to have to come to that realization. Because you are the church. You're the church in Miramar. You're the church in Miami. You're the church in this county. You're the church in this state. You're the church in this nation. And you're the church to the nations. And while all of this is important, nobody is minimizing that at all. This is not the end. This is just simply where we come to be equipped to do what God is leading us to do. So what is God? leading you to do? What have you been wrestling in the Lord against? What is God asking you to do, sir? Man, what, what's God asking you to do? And young person, what, what is God speaking into your heart today? Leaders, what, what is God saying to you? Have we reached the end of the road or are we simply here because God has something even greater and today God is saying, buy the land, buy the land because I have a future that you cannot see. I have a hope that you cannot even understand. I have things that I'm going to do through the life of God's people who gather in this community of faith called Christ's Way that are so miraculous, so overwhelming, so supernatural that all that you can do is say, thank you, God, for what you have done in our lives and in our fellowship. What do you believe God can do? What is God leading you to do? And this morning, what hinders you from responding to God? And we're about to have a time of response. Whoever the musicians are, go ahead and get ready. And there's a lot of space up here in the front. <laughs> and I believe this space is going to be filled today. Not because of what I've said. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I'm the least to be in this pulpit this morning. But because of what God's saying into your heart. There's some folks here today who need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's calling you today unto himself. What do you believe God can do? Can he forgive you? Can he redeem you? Can he erase your past? Can he give you a hope and a future? Absolutely he can. He promises that within his word. And what is God leading you to do right now? Then what hinders you? Come, come today to receive the glorious salvation that comes in none other except Jesus Christ the Lord. To the church today, 25 years. Hallelujah. Tears and prayers and struggle and strife and pain. Times you wanted to give up because you gave out. Times you wanted to quit. Times you doubted. Times you had fear. But God's been faithful. And he didn't just get you here to stop today. What's God leading you to do? What do you believe he can do? And what hinders you from responding? Just to come today. Maybe to pray and say, thank you, Lord, for everything you have done. And I commit my life for what you're yet to do. Whatever you ask of me, in whatever way it might be, whatever small piece it is, Lord, I'm all in. Maybe you just want to come today to one of these pastors and just say, I'm all in. You can count on me, pastor. I'm all in. 
I'm all in, Pastor, because I believe in what God wants to do in this church, in this community. I see the pain. I see the hurt. I see the lostness. I see the darkness that is around us of sin. And there's only one hope, and it is in Jesus Christ the Lord. And we want to be the church that shines the light of Jesus Christ brightly across this community. I'm all in. I'm going to do what God's asking me to do. I'm going to be faithful. And I just want you to come and make that commitment. Oh, for the, next, for the next years that are ahead, be a part of that. And say, I'm all in. I'm all I in. I am thine, O oh Lord. I'm all I've in. heard thy voice. I'm all in. I'm all in. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Would you stand as we sing?